Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Christy Nez, and on behalf of Food in Canada, Canada's only national food and beverage processing magazine, and the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology, welcome to Table Talks, where we bring you regular webinars that give you access to some of the leaders in the food and beverage industry. If you haven't already, please visit CIFST's website for a list of upcoming webinars, which will be continuing till the end of this month. If you are a member of CIFST, registration is for the entire webinar series is free. Today's topic is what happens to trends when the world changes? Before we kick off today's session, I just want to mention that if you have any questions, please write them in the question box and I will be moderating the questions at the end and I will get our speaker to um, hopefully answer them before the end of the webinar. And I would like to now introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Joanne MacArthur and she is a founding partner and president of Nourish Food Marketing, Canada's only full service marketing agency specializing in food and beverage brands from farm to fork. At Nourish, she helps create compelling marketing strategies for food and beverage products in Canada, the US and Europe. She has spent a career building brands at Molson, Procter & Gamble, Unilever and Cadillac Fairview and has worked with entrepreneurs to launch award-winning products and with all levels of government developing programs supporting Canada's food industry. Please welcome Joanne. Thank you, Christy. And uh, welcome everybody if you're uh, sharing uh, your lunch hour with us. Thank you. Uh, so uh, like uh, Christy said, we're specialists. So I like to say we know a lot about a little. And uh, one of the things we've been doing for quite a few years now is we do an annual trend report. Um, and, uh, you know, because we work across the whole food ecosystem, you know, we work with producers, processors, manufacturers, food service associations, not for profits. We're able to kind of connect dots that other people may not see. We also have a lot of um, research databases. Uh, we do a lot of our own original research as well. And so when we put these trend reports together, we do sort of a triangulation of studies. Uh, and we're really looking for those cultural forces. We're not looking for the latest, you know, I see a lot of trend reports that talk about um, celery juice is gonna be the next big thing or charcoal ice cream. That's not a trend, that's a fad. We're looking at those tectonic plate shifts that we think are gonna have lasting change to society. Uh, and when we come out with these trend reports, uh, it, you know, we're not passing judgment because again, we work with clients across all these different areas. Uh, so it's not meant to be a value uh, judgment. It's just where, where we think things could go. And you can see from the last um, three years, I think, uh, you know, we've had a pretty good record. Uh, a number of these trends are still uh, moving forward and growing and taking hold. And then uh, in November, we released our 2020 trend report. Uh, and then this little guy shows up, um, COVID. So, uh, you know, you can't, it's hard to predict these sort of things, never happened before. Uh, so what did this do to uh, the trends? And, you know, I see a lot of pundits out there saying they have the answers. Well, nobody knows. Um, so discount anybody who tells you that. We're really in uncharted territory. Um, we're in a recession. Could we go into depression? Possibly. Is there going to be a second wave? Um, you know, first wave hasn't even been under control everywhere. And if you look at some of the research um, tracking Canadians on what's called sort of a worry curve, um, most recently um, we find that the worry curve is the lowest it's been since March, uh, uh, mid-March. Um, but what is kind of going up is fear of that uh, second wave. And so uh, most recent um, research, uh, they say about 62% of Canadians are really or somewhat worried about that second wave hitting. Uh, and certainly, you know, uh, it would be disastrous if we have to shut things that are just starting to open up again. Uh, so the question is how much of this COVID behavior is gonna remain long-term? You know, I think um, the, there's behavioral science says it takes two to three weeks of a, any sort of thing to become a habit. Well, we're in, I, I don't even wanna think about what week we're in right now. Um, so uh, some of this stuff is gonna stick for sure. Um, and what we're starting to talk about in terms of COVID is rather than talking about post-COVID, um, we're starting to talk about living with COVID uh, because that may very well 
be the reality. And so when we look at our trends, um, I'll, I'll take you through each one and call out how COVID's maybe put them on hold, in some cases, they've actually, COVID's accelerated them. You know, think of um, COVID as sort of um, gasoline. It's an accelerant sometimes for this. And certainly we've seen this massive shift in sheriff's stomach uh, in terms of channels as well as behavioral. Um, we see consumers now um, on shopping missions. They're going out, they're shopping every two weeks, uh, in and out of the store quickly. They're being more mindful about what they're Line. You know, we know food waste is uh, top of mind. They want things that are going to last. Uh, we saw a real spike in frozen food, for instance, and, and canned food, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, we were largely had moved to uh, summoning our meal. We had just crossed that 50% mark where most of our meals were actually summoned from out of home, whether it was grocery, um, HMR sections, takeout delivery, or uh, quick serve or fine serve restaurants. So we'd actually gone to where half of our share of stomach was going from there, and then all of a sudden that stopped. And so, you know, we've moved from this summoning meal or meal assembly to now kind of cooking as a pastime. And we're discovering newfound cooking skills and quite often as a family activity. And in fact, uh, the latest McKinsey research said that that's cooking at home is the number one activity that has increased during this period. And I think uh, some of that behavior will stick. And you're also getting, you know, that younger generation of uh, future consumers uh, that are also learning new skills in the kitchen and getting comfortable uh, with that. And in fact, if you look at our trend report from a couple of years ago, we were talking about, you know, will uh, cooking from scratch possibly go the way of um, sewing? Uh, so if you think back, you know, 20 years, every home had a sewing machine and they don't anymore. And in Toronto, where uh, I'm speaking from, our office in Toronto, we have new condos being built that don't have entire kitchens from a cost standpoint and also just a recognition that consumers just kind of heat. So it has a microwave, a hot plate, and of course the, the all important coffee maker. Uh, so we saw that as a, as a trend, but I think this is one thing that's been turned on its head. We'd also move to uh, that whole meal assembly idea. Um, and in a lot of cases we were building our meal with a number of different snacks and snacking throughout the day. And I think we've seen a return to three square meals a day, partly because consumers and families are really craving routine. Um, food waste was top of mind and it's becoming even more top of mind right now. When you're shopping every two weeks, you want things to, la to last. And uh, there's been a resurgence in comfort foods. Uh, you know, I think there's a saying in, in extraordinary times, we reach for the ordinary. And certainly we saw um, things like meat initially to have a real spike in sales as consumers went to that. Uh, we saw new routines being created, that end of day quarantine, uh, just to signal um, that the day, the workday has ended and we're now morphing into leisure time because of course, you know, it's all fluid. We have we live in a time of fluid day parts. Most people can't even tell you what day of the week it is sometimes. Um, and we also um, have seen uh, people packing on weight. Uh, so the COVID-15 is a real thing. But most recently, I think it's partly summer, but also a function of things starting to open up. Um, it's almost become a time right now of New Year's resolutions. So consumers are refocusing on health. Uh, they're trying to lose the weight, get healthy again. And I think also there's this realization that we could be living with this condition for quite a while. And COVID really attacks people with underlying health conditions. So there's been a real refocus on immunity and uh, food as um, a primary tool for health and wellness. And the other thing we've seen, certainly um, looking at consumer sentiments online uh, and as marketing to them, uh, you know, consumers early days, it was all about stay safe, uh, nothing was funny, but now like people just want a little mental relief, more uh, lightheartedness, and we're seeing that in COVID um, fatigue. So the big question of course, is how much of these trends are gonna stick around? 
And we've seen, you know, in terms of challenges and opportunity, you know, that definition of place has really changed. Uh, your kitchen is now also your office and is also, if you have kids, school. Uh, you know, the fluid day parts that I mentioned, the whole everything just kind of morphs. You're working at different hours and it's really hard to make those defined stops uh, in a day. And we've also seen a huge change in traffic patterns. If you're not commuting to your workplace, you're not going and summoning food and grabbing food the same way you used to. Uh, and in stores, we're certainly seeing the big brands are winning because they were the ones that were able to um, supply. Um, you know, we work with retailers as well, and, you know, early days, it was all about that distribution system having to pivot and get more product on shelves, and the big players were able to add that third shift. They were able to um, go to larger sizes that consumers were able to pan pantry load with. And so what we've seen is consumers are starting to rediscover big brands. There had been this whole trend away from big food. Uh, and now consumers are, you know, loyalty levels have fallen off and you're going to take whatever pasta sauce is available, right? Uh, and so in some cases, they're getting a real new um, uh, appreciation of big brands because of the smart big brands have been cleaning up their ingredient decks since the last time those consumers may have tried them. Um, you know, I think of, uh, you know, KD Craft Dinner, um, a lot of the ConAgra products, they've really cleaned up decks. So consumers are starting to have a second look at what I call big food. With that though, of course, innovation is struggling. Uh, none of the retailers have been in their head office mark uh, offices for quite a while. And you know, their focus has been on just making sure they don't have, they minimize out of stocks. So they're not listing any new innovate, innovative products. Um, that being said, um, you know, they will all be, I am told they will all be back uh, in their offices, all the buyers come September, and there's gonna be a pent up demand for innovation. So that innovation pipeline that you may be working on, you want to continue because there's going to be a pent up demand both by retailers as well as by consumers. So uh, in the meantime, it is harder to get discovered. Um, and a lot of uh, those brands are going, they're shipping direct to consumer, they're bypassing traditional retailer. So you're even seeing food service um, and uh, restaurateurs creating their own products and going directly to consumers. Uh, and, uh, you know, with boomers, uh, they've even um, been uh, online and, uh, you know, their kids have gotten them onto shopping apps and things like that. So now you're getting all generations doing that. Um, what we do know is, as I mentioned, there's that pent up demand for connection and experiences. We're wired to be social. And what the most recent uh, research is showing though is we're becoming two Canada's. So you've got, if you manage to keep your job during this time, you actually have more discretionary income because you don't have commuting costs, you don't have childcare costs, uh, you're not traveling, you're not eating out the same way. So your discretionary income has gone up. On the other hand, if you are largely in hospitality food service, um, you uh, are having a hard time making the rent and you are um, certainly shopping private label and potentially shopping the food bank as well. So there's, we're really seeing um, two Canada's coming out of this and based on what's happening with food service and hospitality in that industry, I think that's gonna stay with us uh, for a while. Uh, we know fresh food's gonna be more expensive. The latest um, uh, research shows we're probably looking at increases of five to 6%, uh, which is quite a big jump versus what it had been in the past. Um, and then domestic travel, it's all going to be about widening circles, but staying within Canada. So at the start of this, you know, your, your circle was sort of, you know, driveway drinks across from your neighbor. But now people are starting to venture out a little more, getting a little more adventurous. You know, at first it was sort of that three kilometer range. Now we're getting um, bigger. But for the foreseeable future, I think there's going to be um, really focus on Canada and discovering Canada and wanting to support your local neighbors uh, and communities. Uh, in 2008, we certainly saw a resurgence in farmers markets and support for uh, local coming out of the recession. And I think that one's gonna be on steroids uh, coming out of COVID. And of course, now we're at that point where we're really bored of hanging out at home. Uh, and we're also really bored of our own cooking. 
So now that's sort of the COVID preface. Now I just want to go through those 2020 trends that I talked about and uh, talk about what we saw and where we see those going. So the first one was unpackage me. So uh, if you think of the term single use plastic, that wasn't part of the consumer lexicon two years ago. And now you see it popping up everywhere. Uh, and you know, it started with that straw, that, that visual of the straw through the turtle's nose. Um, but now um, microplastics are showing up in our poop, right? So this is becoming a real issue. And you know, part of it, recycling does not seem to be the, the answer. We need to tackle this at the source because recycling is confusing. It's confusing for consumers. Each municipality is different. Quite often you have different rules at home versus the office. Uh, and a big part of recycling, food wrappers and containers. Um, so of course, consumers will put the onus on the industry to fix this. So the question is, you know, how are you gonna fare in a zero plastic waste future? We've taken a bit of a step back, um, of course, with COVID, um, but you know we're starting to see solutions like a compostable or edible packaging. Um, Glenn Levitt, these were the uh, seaweed pods, bit of a gimmick, um, but if you look at Nature's no Nose, that's a compostable package. It also um, extends shelf life by 50%. So that's a bit of a win-win. A and we also, you know, as I mentioned, that whole concept of food waste is also top of mind with consumers. Um, and so, you know, we, we think that there's going to be more closed loop store um, systems. And the real challenge, if you move away from packaging, especially um, in bulk and fresh, how do you tell your story? How do you differentiate yourself if you're a brand? And it's really, we see this one, there's gonna be a real refocus here. This is not going away. And in fact, I think it'll be on steroids because there's gonna be a consumer guilt offset. We are all um, buying more online. And I know I certainly feel guilty every time I see all the packaging that comes with that. I feel terrible every time I you know, have those single use plastic bags. Um, right now, there's not a fix for that. All the be, bring your own container programs, whether it was at your local coffee shop, whether it was going to bulk barn with your own containers or Metro, those have all been put on hold while the industry figures out safe protocols for that. Um, the top left picture is actually um, Loop, the Loop system uh, that Loblaws is, um, they Last I heard, they're still planning to go forward with, uh, with introducing this in September. And what it is, is it's similar to um, what I call the industry standard bottle uh, from my time at Molson. Uh, and it's that common beer bottle that got collected in one central place in Ontario, the beer store, got cleaned and sent out and refilled. And it was used an average of 15 times. And that's what this um, Terra Loop system is all about. And so haagen you see it there, um, they're able to um, design their own package that gets collected at Loblaws, gets sent, cleaned, refilled, goes back. You, if you think about um, packaging, it's really it's an expense, right? It's, you're not making an investment, it's an expense. Uh, it's a one-time use and gone. Well, if you can amortize the cost of this over 15 uses, all of a sudden you can start investing in much nicer packaging um, to tell your brand story. And most recently, that bottom left, um, that's Diageo, uh, they just announced they are going to come out with um, a sustainable um, cardboard, um, non-PET, uh, bottle uh, that's also uh, fully recyclable. And again, you know, this has been done by a third party, Unilever's looking at this, as well as Pepsi. And I do think going forward, um, it's going to be industry working together that solves this pro problem rather than a single uh, company. And so I think um, there's that guilt, guilt offset, but we've all seen this picture of Venice. All of a sudden, you could see the fish that were always there, and the water was clean. So I think through COVID, there's been a real sense of if we all get on the same side of an issue, solving a pandemic, we can do amazing things. And so I think we are going to see that pivot to planet health and sustainability. Uh, and in fact, there was some research in April um, that said consumers are more conscious 
and do feel they can make more of a difference. And I'm sure that that's gone up uh, if we were to uh, look at a more recent research study. And we also know younger generations, huge hot button for them. So uh, I do think that this one uh, is going to reemerge as a hot trend once we start emerging out of uh, stage two behavior with COVID. Right, so the thing is how, if you're a manufacturer, how do you end up telling your origin story uh, and how do you get ahead of this with the consumer? So the next trend I wanna talk about is uh, sober me. And uh, this one I would say uh, has, is on hold, but again, I expect it to come back. Uh, so, you know, we had seen this concept of dry January, which has started to take hold. It started in the UK, had moved to North America, uh, was starting to be a big thing. And it was actually evolving to Sober 2020. And there's, I don't know if you've seen those two books, but there's this Sober Curious movement uh, that's really taken hold with Gen Z and millennials. Um, you know, one of the ways we as a generation um, define ourselves is by being different than our parents. And uh, we looked at our boozy um, boomer parents and said, don't want to be like that. And so there are movements uh, online, there are actual meetings, conferences around this whole concept of uh, not drinking or, or um, really minimizing drinking that's taken hold. And we see this as uh, the next stage of the wellness uh, revolution. Now, of course, it's been on pause with that whole um, daily quarantini trend, but I think there's been, a, there is, as I said, a, a refocus on health and wellness. Um, whole foods, uh, just had a, a two-day um, conference on immunity and wellness products, and they actually uh, had a virtual uh, um, immutini uh, for everybody to, uh, to have that was uh, alcohol-free. Uh, now, part of this is uh, cannabis, you know, not mixing and some people using um, can, uh, CBD as a way to lower anxiety rates. Um, but consumers still want drinks with benefits. And that means they don't want virgin something, you know, something where you're taking something out of. They now, this next generation of drinkers, they want things that are low or no alk, but they want things added to it. So, you know, adaptogens, nootropics, these are all things um, that have functional benefits that have been around longer, have certainly more research than CBD. Um, and uh, so we think that, you know, there's going to be um, a real renewed focus on these kind of immunity boosters and anxiety busters. So think, you know, turmeric, um, mushrooms, uh, caffeine, all, all those kind of um, products as well. And it's really thinking about why are consumers drinking? What is their need state? Is it to relax? Uh, is it to revive? And is there a better way of doing this than the traditional alcohol? And what we're seeing is consumers are actually willing to pay for this. When bars were still open uh, in Toronto, you know, places like Sweaty Betty, they had, um, you know, drinks, non-alcoholic drinks with benefits uh, that were, you know, 11, 12 bucks. Uh, you need to see Seedlip, uh, which Diageo just bought. Again, not a cheap product. It runs about $60, no alcohol in it. Um, so question, you know, can you, um, can you come up with a product, design a product that helps people not only relax, but also um, be more social? Our next trend is know me. And we saw in um, 2019, we started to see a number of companies, Walmart, um, McDonald's, by um, some AI companies. Uh, and this is all about hyper-personalization. McDonald's, for instance, bought two AI companies in 2019. One was a company that predicted weather patterns and would connect with um, their drive-through menus um, based on the weather. So if it was a really hot day, would you like a nice cap um, or a certain milkshake? Uh, and the other slightly terrifying AI company they bought actually uh, recognizes your license plate and uh, knows what you ordered last time, which could be really, really dangerous if somebody else is in the car with you. Uh, but of course, now we all have, you know, AI is taking off. 
because we're now sharing more information, especially if we're buying things online. Um, but most of us, you know, with smartphones or wearing something on our wrist, um, you know, there's there's that opportunity uh, to really affect our behavior and the way we eat and things like that. And so um, there's an interesting product or an interesting thing called DNA Nudge uh, that was in um, the test in the UK and is just um, going into the US now, um, I believe in Kroger. Uh, and I just want to show you a video. Uh, and again, DNA nudge, if the video doesn't play that well, uh, it might be stuttering for some of you, but I do think it's you'll, you'll get the idea. different foods suit our bodies better. DNA Nudge understands your body's needs. This makes it the perfect shopping companion. When you're out shopping, it nudges you to make healthier choices. Choices that are right for you. It's not a diet. You still decide whether you want to eat this or this. DNA Nudge uses your unique DNA code to nudge you. Helping you make my choice. We simply do this by indicating green or red, helping you to make an informed choice. You can also use Nudge Share based on your family's DNA. So if I get a green light on a snack, should I eat it? You can, but you can't overtake it. We live different lifestyles. DNA Nudge promotes an active lifestyle. Sitting still for too long during the day may change what DNA Nudge recommends you eat. For example, a snack that indicated green might now be amber. To get back to green, you need to move a little. Remember, move a little and get the green light in your hand. Because we're all unique, one of these snacks will suit you better. And over time, many small changes can make a big difference to your health. My DNA, my choice. So I think that this is actually going to uh, be one of those trends that perhaps even accelerates. Um, because what we're seeing is grocers are now, because of how online grocery has really gotten a push with COVID, online grocers are investing more um, and they're customizing that online experience. Those loyalty cards everybody uses, it's, it's um, more about data for, for the grocer, right? Um, rather than loyalty. They want to understand what else you're buying and how they can nudge you already. So something like this is a bit of a natural. Uh, and as I mentioned, even boomers have um, been embracing technology um, in terms of, and, there, and people are willing to trade off that data privacy right now. Um, so uh, the security of that versus personal security. And as long as you can show some value uh, consumers seem to be okay. So there I do think we're going to continue to see more hyper-personalization. One place that will take a, a backseat though, we talked about in the trend report, um, IBM Watson. You may remember IBM Watson from Jeopardy. Uh, and uh, so IBM's come out with something called the Trend Spotter tool. Uh, and what it does is it scrapes all sorts of data out there, um, whether it's menu boards, um, you know, people's social feeds, and it's it had come up with a predictive model to try to increase the odds of new products succeeding. I would say anything right now that's using an algorithm based on past behavior um, is gonna be in trouble. Uh, so that's one thing that I do see taking a step back, and I think new product development, for those of you are, that, who are involved in that, uh, you probably need to look at it in a slightly different way than you did before. Those basis tests that you know I've been, I was doing for decades um, with P&G with Unilever, um, those may not be as predictive uh, in the future as they have been in the past. Uh, so again, if you are making use of this data, um, I think the consumer is more open to sharing it, but of course there has to be a return for them. They have to feel like they're getting something of value. Okay, so this trend is not only going forward, but it is accelerating. And this is the save me trend. 
so it, that's where we talk about environmental impact-based eating. And we knew that um, pre-COVID climate change had already been a top issue. But right now we're seeing huge discussion around protein sources. And uh, we have to remember where did this pandemic start? Uh, and what we're seeing is um, early days, um, meat took off um, for comfort reasons, but now plant-based has taken over. And that's where the real growth is right now uh, and we're moving from you know aspirational to the necessary in some cases uh, as there's been shortages um, in meat uh, and we're having to bring in some imports as well and costs frankly are going to go up a lot uh, and you know consumers never really thought about where their food came from there was a real disconnect there. Uh, you know, I've been surprised during the pandemic when I have conversations with friends, they don't really understand. We have one distribution system for food service, a different distribution system for um, retail. Um, so consumers really didn't understand that. Uh, and they also didn't understand how our industrial processing system worked. Um, but now um, it's been, it's top of mind because they've seen it. Uh, in numerous uh, newspapers and uh, you know one thing we always look at is Google Trends so what are Canadians searching and asking questions about and you can see meat processing wasn't really there and then bang see that st spike so it is definitely um, top of mind so the question is what kind of trade-offs are the consumers going to make especially uh, those who have less discretionary income and one thing uh, we've seen uh, with COVID is just how connected the world is, the planet, our health. Um, so there's a new appreciation for that. And so, um, you know, we talk about a climatarian diet um, that's, you know, consumers base eating based on uh, their environmental footprint and making choices in that way. Uh, so rather than for um, other values or health reasons, they're now doing it for environmental reasons. We're also seeing the rise of blended products. And this isn't anything new. Uh, if you look back during World War II, there were victory, um, there were posters for victory meat, which was extending your meat by adding oats. And you know, I'm a boomer. Um, I had a, a mother who grew up in uh, work, wartime England, uh, and you know, I grew up with hamburgers that were half oats, half hamburger. It was a way to extend the grocery bill. And that kind of old behavior is actually starting to come back. And so you're seeing, you know, Tyson and Purdue, you know, these 50-50 blends products. Um, Maple Leaf just came out with their new 50-50 um, product. So it allows you to get the taste and texture that you like while still lowering your environmental impact. And it's interesting, Maple Leaf has uh, changed their vision statement to now be the most sustainable protein company in the world. You won't see the word meat in there. It's about protein. Uh, so that's interesting. And uh, the Super Bowl advertising, um, Maple Leaf, the only ad they ran was about their environmental commitment. They weren't showcasing any products. Uh, so, you know, they're definitely uh, reading uh, the research as well. And so blended products is starting, we're starting to see it, it um, pop up in categories other than just meat as well. Uh, and so milk, which was the first product to really um, blow up uh, plant-based, uh, you know, in the dairy case, uh, we're now starting to see um, milk almond blends. And this is actually from some dairy farmers in the U.S. Um, Bell, they are the uh, huge um, company out of France that makes those baby Bell cheeses. They've come out with a half and half product as well. So, you know, I expect we're going to start to see this and it's really a different way of doing flexitarianism rather than saying I'm going to be plant-based or I'm going to do meatless Monday or, you know, it's a different way of doing it and perhaps it's easier uh, for uh, consumers, a more palatable way of doing it, so to speak. Um, and we're also seeing, um, you know, this real push, the Starbucks CEO, they did um, an environmental assessment of their entire ecosystem and they found that the number one carbon footprint item was dairy. It was contributing 21%. Uh, so if you go into a Starbucks anytime soon, uh, you know, it's sort of the 
option is plant-based um, milks or uh, black. That's sort of what they're pushing uh, rather than dairy now. We know that meat and dairy um, are real hot buttons with younger generations, Generation Z, millennials. Uh, and so what we're uh, expecting as well uh, is a move to more sustainable animal proteins. Uh, certainly over the past decades, meat protein has really come down in price. It takes a much smaller percentage of the grocery bill than it used to. And of course, as, hu as humans, what do we do? We uh, end up eating more meat. Right, so prices come down, we increase uh, the amount of meat. And you could argue now that we kind of have a protein fixation and eat too much potentially um, protein uh, and not enough fiber. Um, but we're starting to see people gravitate to what they see as more humane um, or better meat. So whether that's um, grass-fed and grass-finished, A&W just moved to 100% Canadian grass-fed, grass-finished. Um, if you, you know, more responsibly grown and raised. Uh, so that concept of eating less but better. Uh, and uh, got, uh, this is um, a company, um, meat company in the US, a rancher, um, and they've been Audubon certified because their ranching practices um, use regenerative agriculture and uh, they are um, creating or protecting um, bird um, grasslands. And so they've got an Audubon certified. Uh, we're seeing other labels like uh, Certified Humane also start to bubble up. And this is a new one um, I'm adding post-COVID because there's been a lot of discussion about worker health in a way we've never seen before. Those workers in the processing plants, uh, those migrant workers who come into our com country aren't treated as well as they should be, uh, but we still expect them to bring those crops, plant those crops, bring those crops back. And so consumers all know the fair trade designation, but that's for products that are from outside of North America. Will we start to see the same thing happen for things that are grown here? Uh, and one of the marks I'm seeing starting to really pop up in the US is this food justice certified. Uh, and it's that concept of, uh, we talked about a made matters trend uh, in past year's trend reports. Uh, and it's that idea of radical transparency. And also, you know, tell me not just how the animals were treated, um, how resources were treated, but how were the workers treated um, in the making of this product? So this is something that I think could um, be on the future coming out of COVID. And so if you do have a lower impact product, you know, how can you leverage this with consumers? And if you don't have one, should you be considering coming up with one of those blended kind of products? Now this trend, I'm going to say it's on hold and it may be falling off the table, but uh, I'd be interested in uh, hearing your comments uh, and what you think is going to happen uh, uh, through this. So this is the science me trend. And this is the whole idea of redefining what is real food in a high tech era. And so we know that over the last decade, consumers have really shifted away from processed food. Um, processed food in their mind became bad. They were moving to real food, shorter ingredient lists, clean labels, um, things I know can pronounce. Um, and then these products came out, Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger. Uh, they have really long ingredient lists um, and, you know, Certainly, if you're eating for these products for personal health rather than planet health, not necessarily all that uh, healthy. And so, you know, are consumers really willing to make that kind of trade off? And it's interesting, um, in the US, there's been full page ads uh, in newspapers uh, talking about what's hi hiding in your plant based meat. And it drives you to this cleanfoodfacts.com website, uh, which is actually funded by the Center for Consumer Freedom. And if you dig into who that is, um, one of them is Tyson. Tyson used to own, um, have a big stake in Beyond Meat. They sold that and then they came out with their half and half product. Um, there's some quick serve restaurants in there, a number of other industry folks as well. But they're really calling out this idea of whole minimally processed versus ultra processed foods. Um, so 
you know, plant-based we know is taking off, but are people going to start looking at these products in a different way and want to go back to more of the whole food uh, rather than this? And, you know, this whole, um, this is a new um, thing that's happened uh, during COVID. Perfect Day has just uh, come out uh, and they use cell egg. Um, so they take the uh, it's cellular agriculture. Uh, they've come out with animal free milk using the milk DNA and cells. Uh, and uh, they're starting to come out with products. And, you know, the question is, have we crossed the line? Is this, you know, now consumers going to say ick? Um, you know, there's this, uh, you know, return to Eden. I want wholesome versus progress through science. Right now, though, we all kind of want science to win, right? Uh, we want that vaccine to work. Um, but you have to wonder, you know, are consumers really going to want to grab that lab-grown product, especially when we see how they react to, uh, to GMOs as well. Uh, just going back to the whole ultra-processed foods, you can see a Google trend there. Uh, it's shown up in press as well. Um, and this is the, um, the, there was some research in uh, the British Journal of Medicine, two studies that talked about um, how ultra-processed foods were um, potentially cancerous, um, caused obesity. So there's been a number of news reports and so that's starting to bubble up with consumers as well. You can see um, the uh, CEO of Chipotle said, you know, we're never going to carry um, these kind of products. Um, so interesting to see what's going to happen because as I say, consumers have a new appreciation for science right now. It's going to be the thing that saves us but how much of that uh, do we want? Uh, so is there gonna be a growing role for whole foods, blended foods? Be interested in uh, your perspective on that. Now, entertain me, definitely on hold because nobody's feeling entertained in a grocery store right now. Um, but I do think that as we get past stage, you know, into stage three, there's all this pent up desire for experience. And I think this one may morph a little, um, but that whole experiential idea um, trend is going to continue. Um, sampling initially in stores was put on hold, uh, but now uh, Costco's starting back with it, uh, and there's new ways of doing sampling that are emerging. Um, and we've seen that whole shift to online, as I mentioned, um, but there's more direct to uh, producer relationships as well. Uh, so those of you in Toronto, you may have seen Italy, you may have seen Longo's new Liberty Village stores, uh, and certainly they were giving more um, real estate to the perimeter of the store and it was almost like little stores and restaurants within a store. Uh, so with Longos, the entire store is actually licensed. You can walk around uh, with a drink. Um, you can sit down, have a meal there. That's on hold right now. Um, but we do know that for younger people, especially those living in uh, small little glass boxes in the sky with not a lot of uh, real estate, um, you know, they are looking for those in real life experiences and a chance to be social. And this had been fitting the bill for them. Uh, so we'll have to see uh, what happens there as well. One thing, though, I do think uh, in terms of grocery store, that center of the store you know, as we've seen online grocery accelerate, I think center of the store is gonna be the one that continues to migrate online. Perimeter, consumers really enjoy shopping. Like that's just, consumers do bottom line like to grocery shop, especially the perimeter of the store. It's interesting, it's where they discover new products uh, and uh, those experiences as well. Um, and if you look at a retailer like Farm Boy um, that Sobeys has, has purchased, um, they actually, um, when they built Farm Boy, it was all about the experience. And you can't buy paper towels. Like there are a number of categories. You go to a Farm Boy, they position themselves as your second retailer um, because you will not be able to get a full basket there. And some things they've just has migrated to online, those staple kind of products, and they don't see that as a differentiator. They don't carry them. And so I mentioned the resurgence in farmers markets in 2008 and really that buy local 
And I think this is where this is going to morph. We're seeing that whole buy Canadian. I want to know the person behind my food. I want to know the farmer. And so I think there's an opportunity to tell more of those producer stories. If you're Canadian, if you're a commodity that's grown in Canada, you want to tell those stories. Um, because consumers have uh, really become, as I mentioned, disconnected from their food, but they want to know more. And again, that Google trend, you can see that huge spike uh, at the start of COVID, food supply, nothing that the consumer ever thought about. Um, you know, 91% of consumers pre-COVID said they knew little or nothing about modern farming practices. Well, now they want to know more. Uh, you know, 10% of consumers have ever actually stepped on a real working farm. That's pretty shocking. And that number continues to go down uh, generation by generation. But on the other hand, we know that who consumers trust the most in all of this, it's not the researchers, it's not the companies, it's, you know, farmers and producers uh, are the most trusted. They actually have higher, they're up there with doctors, um, with vets. Uh, so you want to be able to tell those producer stories and somehow bring that story um, into the online grocery environment or the in-person grocery environment. And I just wanted to show you a couple of clever things um, that I see doing them doing. This is an Irish company. They sell um, uh, potato chips, but they also own the potato, uh, the, the field where the potatoes are grown. They grow them. And so on the back there, you can see that spud nap. And so you can pop in, uh, you go to the website, you pop in the, the uh, code and it will take you immediately to the field where that potato chip, uh, the potato that's in that potato chip was grown. And you know they're gonna taste better and you're gonna feel better about it. Uh, another example in the US, Vital Farms, they have about 200 small family farm egg farmers uh, and you can actually, um, find your farm and uh, with a QR code, you can get a 360 uh, view of that happy hen that laid your eggs and the conditions there. And so, you know, if you're a manufacturer, uh, how do you keep your place as things are migrating online? How do you tell your, your story and really contribute to that shopper experience? My last trend before we open it up to uh, questions is keto me. And this actually has morphed and is actually uh, going up a little bit. Uh, so uh, last year's trend report, we talked about how consumers all have sort of a specialized way of eating. Um, and uh, it's sort of selective way, whether it's gluten-free, something like that. And it's all about optimizing not just physical, but also mental performance. And keto uh, was uh, predicted to be the top diet trend for 2020. Um, but we talked about in, the, um, in our trend report, uh, while it was the most talked about and the top diet trend, we said, we think this is gonna be really hard to do though, because it's just, there's so much to it, right? Um, but where we did see it keep gaining traction was in terms of keto-friendly products. So you're starting to see those keto-friendly um, sections in grocery stores, similar to what you saw with gluten-free, um, you know, 10 years ago, industry was saying, well, is this a fad or a trend? Well, those gluten-free areas are here to stay. It's taken hold. And we think keto will as well. Um, but the interesting thing is uh, this one's morphed a bit. So where keto was number one at the beginning of uh, 2020, right now, number one diet, intermittent fasting which is part of keto, it's a small part, um, but I think that's being fueled by the fact that consumers have more control over their day right now um, by working from home. And so intermittent fasting has gone off the charts. Um, and so, you know, how as a marketer do you fit into that? You know, can you come up with products that help um, consumers during that fasting period or as they come off that fasting period because that's also a thing. And uh, the other thing that we saw was, you know, those keto-friendly products, will that morph from no carbs? Because let's be honest, carbs are delicious. Um, will it move to slow carbs? And in Australia, um, there's this GI labeling, glycemic index um, labeling. Uh, so they actually have to um, call it out uh, what the GI levels are in Australian packaging. 
in Canada, Diabetes Canada uh, has lobbied the government in the past to try to push for this. Uh, and apparently um, they're uh, doing a second push right now as well. So this very well may be something. So keto, uh, we think it's here to stay, but it's morphing a bit. Um, and you know, the other thing is that COVID-15, everybody knows somebody who's on the keto diet and you've seen the results, like, you know, whether they can do it for a long time, period of time, but it does seem to get results. And so I think that's why we're seeing that uh, as well as intermittent fasting as uh, the top two diets. Uh, so how do you fit into that? Um, so that is uh, me for trends. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more, please link in with me, uh, send me a note, uh, go to our website, which is nourish.marketing, no.com, no.ca, uh, and you can sign up for newsletters. You can download our trend report as well as past trend reports. And uh, now I wanna open it up and hear some questions. Great, thank you so much, Joanne. And just wanna remind everyone, please, if you have a question, to write it in the question box. Um, Joanne, I have a question, and you and I had chatted on the phone uh, last week. Regarding um, new product launches, or if you know innovation has taken a little bit of a hit, what should um, food manufacturers or any brands be ready for in September if new meetings are being taken? Like how should they prepare for that if they have a new innovative product that a retailer might be interested in? Yeah, make sure the research isn't from a year ago because make sure you it's COVID relevant. So make sure that you future-proofed it for these new COVID trends. Uh, and I think um, local is gonna be a huge hot button with retailers. So if you can tell something about local as in Canada, uh, immunity, wellness, these are huge hot buttons. So if you've got a product that's gonna um, fit in there, I think that's gonna be, um, you, you'll get the uh, retailer's attention because they will want to start differentiating themselves with innovation. Uh, that won't happen until the fall, but it's it'll come. Okay, thank you. You talked a lot about how a brand can differentiate itself, you know, as far as terms of animal welfare or ethical sustainability, where products come from. There, that's a lot of information for consumers. Do you have any guidance on how a product can stand out from the rest or maybe perhaps how to approach this without having a box or a, a bottle that's full of different labels that really, you know, perhaps yeah. might not mean much to a consumer? Yeah, so I think there's different levels. Um, so certainly what you can tell on the front of a package versus what you can tell on social media versus what you can tell on a website, right? You can go deeper and deeper with your story. So in terms of packaging, you may want to just um, show a logo that consumers understand, whether it's fair trade, whether it's raised humanely, um, and then, you know, back panel, tell a little bit more of that story, um, go deeper uh, on social, and then in your website. Um, and we always say show versus tell. So it's fine to have, you know, a whole write-up about what you believe in, what you stand for, what your story is, um, but it's a whole lot more powerful if I can see a video or even better, those examples I showed you of where you're actually seeing it in real time. Uh, so that's that radical transparency. And I think that's where, where it's gonna work. But again, it's, it's three different levels, right? It's the, you know, catch their interest with something, go deeper uh, in terms of the story on digital, and then let them go as deep as they want to on your website. Thank you. Uh, one more question, another question that I have, sorry. Um, we've seen a lot of sort of elevated meal kit ideas or, you know, food service is, is taking a bit hit, a big hit. So if anyone's supplying the food service industry and or restaurants are sort of doing that sort of higher end takeout or that experience, how could a brand help them out with that? Or are there any opportunities that exist there? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Yeah, meal kits like, we're calling that meal kit 3.0 actually so meal kit 1.0 was you know the traditional just eat just bite whatever uh and 
let's be honest, before this, they were going like this, right? They were not succeeding. They were not making money. Uh, meal Kit 2.0 was where the retailer got into it, right? So you saw some uh, retailers actually buying Meal Kit companies, Kroger bought Blue Apron, um, you know, retailers came out with their own meal kits. Eh, those have had really mixed results. This, I think, is Meal Kit 3.0, which is that elevated experience. So you've got your fine serve restaurants coming out with their own kit and they're doing the alcohol pairings, which you now can, uh, with the change in regulations. And you're able to not actually cook, but kind of assemble and do enough that it feels, you know, like an elevated um, dining experience. And, you know, if you've got a product um, that, has some sort of origin story, um, I think there's an opportunity to perhaps get in that box. You know, you're not going to serve Heinz ketchup in there. All, you know, nothing against Heinz ketchup, but it's an elevated experience. So if you've got, um, you know, a local sauce that's made with a story, I think there's an opportunity to um, pair with, with um, those meal kits type things because again it's all about that sort of assembly and pulling it pulling it together um, but certainly it's been uh, very tough for food service and going forward especially fine service um, this could be um, long term a way that you know they continue to survive with this sort of morphed meal kit 3.0 okay thank you um, there's no more questions, Joanne, so I just want to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology, as well as Food in Canada magazine. Um, just to let everyone know, our next speaker in the Table Talk series is Dr. Ricky Yada, who is Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia, and he uh, will be presenting next Wednesday at noon. And also CIFST is pleased to announce that it has scheduled uh, the CIFST Coast to Coast, a virtual showcase, which will take place on October 28th. So please watch your email or visit the CIFST website for more details. Thank you so much, Joanne and everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.